As we travel back in time to rediscover the amazing tales from Tudor Court, we imagine that we were there watching all of these amazing events unfold. When we read books on the topic, we are able to transport ourselves into the body of each of these amazing characters. But in fact, they were not characters at all, but real people like you and me. Hi, my name is Rebecca Larson, owner of TudorsDynasty.com, and you have found my podcast. In today's episode, we continue on with our story about the Tudor dynasty. We look at Mary's time in France as queen up to the year 1522 in English court. I hope you enjoy. Let us start with a little history on Mary Rose. Princess Mary Tudor was born on March 18, 1496. She was the fifth of seven children to Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. Mary became a beautiful young lady and was considered to be one of the most attractive women in Europe at the time. This is no surprise, as the same was said about her mother Elizabeth of York. Poor Mary was only seven years old when her mother passed away. As with her sister Margaret, Mary would play a pivotal role in the political alliances of her country. At the age of six, she had her own household and was given instruction in French, Latin, music, dancing, and embroidery. Henry, Duke of York, future Henry VIII, and Mary got along very well as children. They had a very close relationship. It's said that Henry named the Mary Rose after his favorite sister. It's also believed that his daughter Mary was also named after her. Initially, Mary was betrothed to future Charles V of Spain in 1507, and after many delays, King Henry called off the betrothal. The next alliance and betrothal for Mary, at age 18 years old, was the French King Louis XII. He was 34 years her senior. King Louis had no heir and needed one quickly because his health was failing fast. This was a great alliance for Henry VIII. To have France as an ally would be convenient for England. At the time, young Princess Mary was already head over heels in love with Henry's best friend, Charles Brandon. Marrying Charles was out of the question since he was below her station and not of noble birth. Mary refused to wed the French king, weeping and sulking and demanding to be allowed to marry Charles. Of course, her brother refused. So Mary struck a deal with Henry. She would do her princess duty and marry the French king. But if she were to outlive Louis, which was very likely, she wanted her next husband to be one of her own choosing. Henry apparently agreed, quite possibly with the intention of never honoring his promise. Mary Tudor, Queen of France, was the title she earned when she married Louis XII of France. Marriage was one that was arranged by her brother, King Henry VIII of England, so surely Mary did not enter the marriage loving her elderly husband. On October 9, 1514, at the age of 18, she married the 52-year-old King Louis XII of France. It is evident that the King of France adored his queen. He is quoted as saying in a letter to Henry VIII that the content which he had for his wife and how she had conducted herself with him, he could not find words to explain to Henry, only saying he was very delighted with Mary. Louis had no living son, and it was imperative that they produce an heir soon after the wedding. Mary knew that her elderly husband was ill If she became pregnant with a son and Louis died, that son would be the next ruler and she, most likely, regent. Unfortunately, on New Year's Day, 1515, almost three months after their wedding, King Louis XII died. Mary reportedly wore out the king by his exertions in the bedroom to produce an heir. Their marriage produced no heirs, and Mary was called Dowager Queen after the death of Louis. The new king of France... Francis I attempted to arrange a second marriage for the Dowager Queen, but she only wanted Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk. Her brother Henry VIII had agreed that she could marry whomever she liked after the death of Louis. Little did she know Henry would not stand by his promise. In late January, Henry VIII sent Charles Brandon to bring Mary back to England. He made the Duke promise that he would not propose to her. When Charles Brandon arrived in France, Mary quickly convinced him to abandon his agreement with the King of England. She heard rumors that her brother, the King, was planning a new marriage for her and would not follow through on his original promise. 
Having heard those rumors, Mary and Charles committed treason, since they did not get permission from Henry, by secretly marrying on March 3, 1515, while in the presence of King Francis I. I'm sure Francis took some satisfaction in being part of this event. Henry VIII was furious when he found out his best friend and favorite sister married without his approval or permission. Henry's initial reaction was to remove Charles' head from his body, but after much thought and time, he only fined his favorites and allowed them to officially wed in England on May 13, 1515 in the presence of the king himself and other courtiers. Mary became Duchess of Suffolk but was still called the French Queen. Being a queen outranked being a duchess, and it was a reminder to Mary that she married below her station. Did it really bother her? Probably not. The older sister of Henry VIII, Margaret Tudor, who was herself Queen Consort of Scotland, had gotten herself in a bit of trouble after the death of her late husband, King James IV, in 1513. Margaret was only 23 years old and pregnant when her husband died. Their son James was crowned King James V of Scotland shortly after. At the beginning, she was allowed to act as regent per her husband's will, as long as she did not remarry. Since Margaret had been an English princess and was now named regent for her newly crowned son, this caused quite a rift among the Scottish people. They felt that England was responsible for the death of James IV. In August 1514, Margaret put it all on the line when she secretly married Archibald Douglas, Earl of Angus. Wedding Angus aligned Margaret politically with the Douglas family. However, it also caused her to forfeit her right as regent to her son, as per the will of her late husband. She also lost her rights to the supervision of her sons, King James and Alexander. Her plan to use the Douglas family to assist her with reconciling with Scottish subjects had backfired. Why on earth did she marry if she would lose all her influence on her sons? It's almost like we're reading the tale of her granddaughter, Mary Queen of Scots. In defiance of the Privy Council's ruling, Margaret fled with her sons to Stirling Castle. Eventually, Margaret returned her sons to the new regent. She was now pregnant with the Earl of Angus's child, and they fled to England. The two settled at Harbottle Castle in North of England in September 1515. It was there on October 8, 1515, that Margaret gave birth to their daughter, Margaret Douglas. Margaret's marriage with Archibald Douglas had fallen apart. In October 1518, Margaret wrote to her brother, telling him how her second husband shows her daily that he does not love her. She desperately wanted a divorce. However, King Henry at the time was not keen on the idea of divorce, since he was still aligned with Rome. Many years later, Margaret was granted an annulment. Meanwhile, at the court of Henry VIII in England, there was a rift between royal cousins. Edward Stafford, 3rd Duke of Buckingham, came from a very strong family with legitimate ties to the English throne. As a descendant of Edward III, Stafford had what some believe to be a stronger claim to the English throne since Tudor's claim was through an illegitimate line. If something were to happen to the king and his daughter Mary, Stafford would be considered next in line to succeed to the throne of England. Henry VIII heard of Stafford's claims and ordered an investigation. Stafford was ordered to London from his castle at Thornbury. He set out for Henry's court seemingly unaware of any danger and was shocked when he was stopped and arrested on his way and subsequently taken to the Tower of London. At his trial, Stafford was charged with imagining encompassing the death of the king. Through seeking out prophecy from a monk named Nicholas Hopkins about the chances of the king having a male heir. Evidence was supposedly obtained from disgruntled former members of the Duke's household. As Tudor enthusiasts, we can about imagine how this evidence was actually obtained. Buckingham denied all charges against him, but a jury of 17 peers, led by the Duke of Norfolk, found him guilty. It's said that Norfolk wept when informing Buckingham of his guilt. Thank you for joining me today in Episode 3, A Tale of Two Sisters and Execution of a Noble. In episode 4, we will begin to tell the story of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, a toxic love affair. This will be a good one. This podcast would not be possible without those who have become patrons to my Patreon website called Tudor's Dynasty. With their support, I am able to put in more time researching, writing, recording, and editing my podcasts. If you are interested in joining this group of wonderful individuals, please go to patreon.com slash Tudor's Dynasty. 